Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to cross the Orisund once again and we're going to go back to Seeland in Denmark and revisit a brewery that's featured on the channel many times before. I've had some really nice beers from these guys over the years, a good number of different styles and I think it's fair to say that generally speaking, this brewery is very solid all round. But the beer that we're going to have a look at today is one that they've released for a special occasion. It's a style that you don't come across all that often these days and I think that makes this beer review a little bit more special. So I have to say I'm really, really curious to see what this one has in store for us because this brewery do actually have a good history with this particular style actually. So let's just see how we get on. Hopefully it's another good beer, hopefully it makes for an interesting review and I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. So for this review then, we are going to head to Sfinninge, which is right in the middle of Sjælland, the easternmost of the main islands in Denmark. And we're going to have a look at another beer from Tool, or Two Beers, as the name means in English. But this particular beer is called the 11th Anniversary Triple IPA. It comes in at 11% ABV, which is very fitting. And this one is a West Coast Triple IPA. So uh, yeah, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, you will know that I'm a big fan of the more kind of caramelly and biscuity West Coast IPAs. So when I saw that Tool were releasing one of these for their 11th anniversary, I thought that I needed to get a hold of this one. And I got lucky that it was coming through Sistembo Lagget as well. So uh, yeah, I got this beer as part of the Local Osmoskalik assortment through Sistembo Lagget here in Sweden for December of 2021. And uh, it is supposed to be quite nice, this one. So let's crack on and see how we go with this beer. Always nice to return to Tool. These guys were one of the first Danish craft breweries that I came across, of course. So uh, yeah, let's crack on. So as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Toro before, and you will no doubt see more added to that list in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you can go into the homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefecture, whatever it is you happen to be interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries, there is one there for all the Danish beers I've reviewed for you. That's being added to quite regularly, of course, because I live in the south of Sweden, very close to Denmark, and the Danish beers are quite easy to get in that case. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely, hugely appreciated. So anyway, on to my brewery notes then to tell you once again about Total. So Total as I've told you before, was founded by Tobias Emil Jensen and Tori Geinter, and these guys were students of Mikael Bjergso, who is, of course, the big boss of Mikeler. But originally, they brewed with him in their school kitchens until about 2005, and then they continued to homebrew together until about 2010, when they founded Total, which, as I explained earlier, in English means two beers. But when Mikael heard that his former students were still brewing, he insisted that they do a collaboration brew together, and this was what became the first total beer. It was simply called Double IPA. But they very quickly built a strong reputation for themselves, and with the help of Mikeler's links, they managed to distribute their beers worldwide from very early on in their history. But as is the case with Mikeler, these guys were originally a gypsy brewery, and so they didn't own their own brewing equipment, and they used the spare capacity at other breweries, such as the De Prof Brewery at Lopriste Hefte near Ghent in Belgium. But uh, in Nurebro in Copenhagen, they started their collaborative beer bar with Mikeler, which is called Mikeler and Friends. And this bar has an exclusive bottle shop and over 40 different beers on tap. You can check out my out and about video that I did there quite recently and you'll get a look at what this place is all about. But they also now have the Bruce Brew Pub in Copenhagen, which opened in 2016 in partnership with Christian Gadiant, who I believe is a very well respected chef. And there's also now a second Bruce Bar in Oslo. But these two Bruce uh, Brew Pubs, if you like, operate as independent entities. So they've got full control over their own brewing and stuff like this, actually. But they're, they are co-owners as well. 
in the different Mikula and Friends venues, which now includes a bar in Reykjavik and also the bottle shop in Torvahallen in Copenhagen. But they also co-own the Cool Ship and Micropolis bars in the city too. And since 2017, Tori Ganter has been in charge of the company on his own after Tobias Emil Jensen left to found the ETOH or Ethanol uh, Spirits Company. So now Tobias is uh, doing a lot of distilling and things. I'll need to have a look and see if I can try some of those. But as of 2019, uh, Total have a new production facility at Sveeninge, which is right in the middle of sale. And this has a 150,000 square metre floor space. And it's an old fruit factory from what I understand. But they have a clean side of the brewery, which has a large German Braucon kit. And this side of the brewery is run by Tim. And there's also a sour side of the brewery, which has fodders and cool ships and things like this for producing all the different sour beers. And this is run by Nathan Borg. And they've got a lot of space in there for barrel aging, obviously, as well. And there's a few other companies that are doing stuff as well. But they released their first beers from Total City, as it's known, in March of 2020. They've continued to build up this facility over the last kind of year or two. And as of December 2021, when I'm filming this particular review for you, these guys have produced in the region of 570 different kinds of beer, according to Untapped. So uh, yeah, a very, very well respected brewery, as I've mentioned to you already, and we've had some great beers from Toro over the years. Yule Milk is a very well known one. Uh, one of my favourite beers was Dangerously Close to Stupid. Um, you know, the best black IPA that I've ever had has come from these guys, the Black Salts and Body Malts. Uh, First Frontier was a very nice one. I still want to try Final Frontier actually as well. But uh, yeah, the old school beers from Toro were always very, very good. And the new stuff that they're doing is pretty damn nice as well. So um, yeah, that is all I can really tell you about Toro for the moment. But if you want to learn a little bit more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So um, yeah, that's it for your brewery history section of this video. Let's get on and actually have a look at the beer itself. Now, when I was doing a little bit of research on this one, unfortunately, I couldn't find out that, um, I couldn't find out that the, the, the hops or anything that were in this beer, there was nothing listed on untapped or, or anything like that. Actually, even if you went into the beer's profile on Mikula's, uh, on Toro's website, sorry, sorry, you couldn't actually find anything on this. But uh, yeah, it's very, very nicely presented, kind of in the new style that Toro have adopted since they've, uh, since they've gone into cans. And the, you know, the canning really started when they moved into Toro City, but many of the beers that they're still brewing at the, um, at the Prof Brewery are in cans these days as well. I don't think they brew too many things down in Belgium anymore. I think pretty much all the production has been moved up to uh, up to Svenninga. But yeah, 440 milliliter can this one. This beer cost me 70 Swedish kroner, uh, which translates to roughly seven euros, somewhere in the region of like six pounds 25, I guess. And then that will be what, about um, $8 American, something like that. But for an 11% West Coast triple IPA, I don't think we can really complain about that price. It is pretty good. But there you can see, there is the total uh, brewery symbol on this one. This is what you'll see on all other beers. And uh, yeah, let's get this guy out then and we'll get on with the tasting. It says on the side here, the 11th anniversary, triple IPA. We're celebrating all 11 years we've succeeded so far and seeing the 12th year ahead with nothing less than a doozy of a West Coast triple IPA. Cheers to all of you who are with us on this roller coaster journey. So yeah, if memory serves me correctly, this is the first anniversary beer that I've reviewed from uh, Toril actually, so yeah, pretty cool in that sense. And it's nice to see that their beers are making their way over to he, over here to Sweden a bit more regularly. I mean, I've been here six years now and it's only within the last year or so that the Toril beers have been quite readily available. The double IPA, the regular double IPA is available through Sistembolagi. You can get it by going into the, the Hansa shop in Malmö and it's available there. I'm not sure if it's available nationwide uh, you know, if you walk in the shop, but you can order it nationwide, of course. But yeah, we're cracking into this one now. The 11th anniversary, triple IPA, and 11% West Coast IPA. 
from Toro in Sweeninge in Denmark. This looks like an absolute monster of a beer. So um, yeah, this looks great. So as you can see then, I'm not sure how well the colour of this beer is going to show up on the camera, but this, if I put the light through it, this is a lovely, very, very rich dark amber colour, this one. You can see it's got a solid, um, I would say, solid, yeah, three quarter finger of a frothy, I would say cream, very light fawn coloured head actually. One or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass in terms of carbonation, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head, but I mean overall it looks very nice, but it's got a very rich coppery, nice amber colour to it. I'll just try and get this round to the camera here without knocking it so you can see the colour, but just look at the, look at that, colour of this beer is absolutely lovely, still getting used to this new setup that I've got of course. But uh, yeah, remember the colour of your beer depends on one, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, the length of your wort boil is also going to play a role. The longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar caramelises and thus you get a darker colour of beer. Any barrel aging that you do or any adjuncts that you put in is also going to affect the colour of the beer. But we don't really have to care about those two variables in this instance. But uh, yeah, it does look very, very nice this one. Pretty much what you would expect of any West Coast IPA, but because it's a triple IPA, it is a little bit darker. I'm not sure um, exactly what length of wort boil this one will have had, but uh, yeah, probably in the region of like 90 minutes or something. But it certainly does look very nice. Beautiful colour this beer, I have to say. So yeah, thumbs up to Toro in terms of the appearance. But I don't think we really need to say any more about that. We can have a look at the aroma now and just see how we get on with this one. So uh, yeah, let's see how where we go with this. Ooh, that does smell really nice. So straight away, the first thing I'm going to pick up on this beer is that the, the malt base is very, very authentic and it is exactly what you would expect of a West Coast IPA of any description. The other thing I'm going to say though is that I notice this is going to be one of the more kind of new generation West Coast IPAs. Now as I've mentioned in various videos before, one of my main gripes with uh, a lot of these new West Coast IPAs is that they tend not to have the big 80, 90 IBU hit that you used to get from these beers. And that's mainly because a lot of beer drinkers that you have now got into craft beer with the lower IBU um, New England IPAs. So yeah, we don't have the same the same IBU, the same bitterness in these beers um that we used to that we used to have. But um you still to this one in fairness when you're at eleven percent ABV you're gonna get a lot more of that malty character coming out of it because that's where your alcohol comes from. It comes from the sugar and the malt. But yeah, you don't get the same big dankness that you might have got from, you know, the 120 minute IPA from Dogfish Head or things like this. But you still get that lovely note out of them. And for me, there's two different directions you can take a West Coast IPA. It can be a more oily and uh, kind of caramelly sort of thing, or it can be a little bit more bready and biscuity. And uh, I would say the two kind of prime examples of that would be the Sierra Nevada Torpedo on the oily side of things and the Rush, the, the, Russian River Pliny the Elder would be the more uh, a prime example of the more biscuity side, but this one for me really leans a little bit more towards that big oily Sierra Nevada torpedo sort of thing. That's what I'm really getting out of this beer. But let's just break the aroma down for you a little bit more and describe it a wee bit more in depth and succinctly. So, um, backbone of this beer, you can smell a little bit of a, a kind of bread crusty character in there. It comes across as having quite a bit of a, a sort of brown bready wholemeal type character to it. So there's a lot of that coming out of this one, which I, I can certainly appreciate. So yeah, a little bit of bread crust, lovely, quite sweet wholemeal brown bread, and a lot of big caramelly notes sitting on top of that. So it's a big, sweet, oily caramel that you're getting out of this one. The aroma of this beer actually reminds me of Twix biscuits in a lot of ways. My gran always used to want to feed me Twixies when I went in to see her after school every day. So I used to get lots and lots of Twixies, and the aroma out of this beer just reminds me of those. So yeah, lots of sweet caramel in there, a little bit of a McVitie's digestive biscuit for sure. That sits on top of a kind of wholemeal bready base and then you've got a little bit more of a kind of grainy bread crust underneath actually. So yeah, that's worth uh, bearing in mind with this beer. But I think there's maybe one or two very slightly woody undertones for me. 
But other than that, I don't think there's too much to say on the malt base, to be honest with you. Um, no, I would go with that, to be honest. Um, I think on the when it comes to the green component of this beer, there's a few things going on. So for me, there is a little touch of earthiness to this one, which I really like. Um, a good green component, you know, the green component in this beer is quite nice and it gives you a lot of the elements you'd expect. But like I was saying, the the green component in these beers, because they don't have the same bitterness that they once had, I don't I often don't find these beers as big and dank as a as they as they once were. So yeah. So in the old days, West Coast IPAs they had these, you know, big 90 IBU bitternesses and things like this. But a lot of the new generation ones have the same kind of hopping arrangement that you would have with the uh, with the New England. So back in the day, the West Coast IPAs have a lot more dry hopping to them. So remember, when you're talking about the wort boil, earlier on in the wort boil, when you add the hops, you get more bitterness. Um, early edition hops are all about the bitterness, basically. And as you go through the wort boil, you've got a gradual trade-off in terms of you know bitterness over to flavour and aroma. So within the last half hour of the wort boil, this is when you add, you know, a, a lot of New England IPAs have this, the late edition hops, and then dry hopping is all about flavour and aroma. So New England IPAs have late edition hopping and dry hopping. West Coast IPAs have that, but also early edition hopping. The old school ones always had a lot more early edition hopping to give you that big dank bitterness. So with this one, it's got the juiciness and the oiliness that they always used to have, but just not that big dank component. So the big um, oily, juicy fruit character is definitely there in this one. And you've got a nice bit of a floral aromaticity coming out of the beer, but you don't get the big pine resiny or the big pine resiny or spice or, or huge spicy notes that you used to get out of these beers. Definitely a little bit of earthiness in there for sure. So a little bit of a smooth earthiness, a bit of floral aromaticity, and you do get a little bit of a kind of light grassiness out of this beer. But the fruity side of things is exactly what you'd expect. And I think there's probably quite an old school hot profile to this, you know, a bit of Cascade, maybe a little bit of Amarillo, something like that. So there's a few, in, there's a few sort of nostalgic factors going on in this beer. Because on the fruity side of things, I certainly get... There's a wee bit of that old school grapefruity note in there. Um, I do get a little bit of that figgy red fruity note, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a good bit of Cascade in this. Potentially a wee bit of Chinook because you're getting a bit more of that pungent grapefruit in there. Um, I want to say that I think there'll be something like Citra or Simcoe in this. I definitely get a wee tiny touch of a more oily uh, like passion fruit and mango out of this beer. There is a little bit of that, but there's also quite a bit of orange for me, and I love these orangey beers. I, I, I think there probably is a bit of Amarillo in this one. It could be mosaic, because I don't find it quite as zesty as, as Amarillo is going to get you. Amarillo tends to be more oily and slightly more zesty in its orangey characters, but this one feels a little bit lighter, so I wonder if it's mosaic that's in this, rather than, uh, than straight up Amarillo. But I do get just a little touch of a limey note out of this as well, which makes me wonder, could there be a wee bit of Equinot in this? Maybe Motueka would be the other one. I always loved playing Guess the Hops with, with beers back in the days, but these days, because there's so many things out there, it's nigh impossible to get it right. But um, yeah, the, the fruity side of this beer is nice. A big orangey character for me, a little touch of lime, a uh, wee bit of pungent passion fruit bit of mango and then you've got that um, a little bit of red fruity almost cascade chinook type thing uh, underneath in this one so aroma of this beer is really nice as i say very authentic west coast ipa but definitely uh, not giving you the same bitterness that you would have once had from this style uh, i would think it's not giving you that same big kind of dank bitter aroma that you used to get so as I always say, take a little bit of time to ponder over the aroma of the, the beer before you get stuck into it. But I think it is time for us to try this one now. So this is the 11th anniversary triple IPA, a West Coast triple IPA, 11% ABV from Toro in Skeeninge on Sealand in Copenhagen. Always nice to review new beers from these guys. And I'm really curious about this one. So happy 11th anniversary to Toro. Let's get stuck into this one. Slanja, Skull, cheers.
Ooh. That is quite nice, actually. It is a monster. You can taste the booziness in this beer right away. Now, that is one thing I would say about this. This is a 440 milliliter can. And being back in Sweden, unfortunately, I don't have uh, my dad to share this particular can with. But um, yeah, this is going to be one that's a sipper for the rest of the evening. And I'll be pretty merry by the end of that, to be honest with you. But uh, yeah, I'll say straight away, this is a nice beer. And it's interesting because I was I've spent this all this time talking to you about the bitterness that this that, that I always missed of these West Coast IPAs. But at the same time, it does it has a little bit of that. You can feel it does have a wee bit of a kind of dankness to it. So I need to read a little bit more about how they're brewing these more modern West Coast IPAs. Because in some ways, because it doesn't have the IBU. It still feels it feels like it's lacking a little bit compared to what I was drinking with the likes of the Brew Dog, Mister, uh, the Brew Dog Hardcore IPA and stuff like this back in the day, but it's still it, at the same time it's still pretty nice and the flavor profile is the same, so yeah, this is it's interesting. Trying to be like this poses a few questions that we can think about, but I will say they've produced a fairly solid beer here. Is it, as close, is it as good as the dangerously close to stupid that I had quite recently? I'm not, 100, I'm not overly sure with that. The dangerously close to stupid was a, a really, really nice beer. But is it a solid West Coaster? Yeah, I think so. So thumbs up to a toil with this one. Definitely a, a modern West Coast with, without the bitterness that we used to have back in the day. But flavour profile wise, I think it is pretty nice actually. So we can't really ask for much more than that. Mm. so big boozy monster this one absolutely um but yeah this is a big oily dank and quite sweet west coast ipa but 11 percent, you wouldn't expect anything less to be quite honest with you so yeah let's try and break this down for you then so middle of your palate straight away across the middle of your tongue you can feel a little bit of that nice kind of bread crusty quality there on top of that you get a little touch of the kind of wholemeal brown bready sort of thing coming out of the beer and that just sits there the further you go into the aftertaste with this one the more you get the kind of grainy side of the bready character which i find really interesting um but yeah the the it's it's quite straight up actually it really has um, when we talk about this beer in terms of the oily side and the more biscuity side of the West Coast Spectrum, this one really leans towards that more oily, boozy thing. But at 11%, it's surprising how much the breadiness and the graininess actually comes out of it. So yeah, um, nice grainy bread crusty backbone, smooth brown bread on top of that. Then you start to get all the brown sugar. So you can feel on top of that bready layer, you've got a big oily uh, kind of caramelly note out of this one. And the, the brown sugar doesn't feel as if it's overly caramelized but the beer is that boozy that it gives you the impression of the the brown sugar being just a little touch toasty so there is almost a wee touch of a kind of toasty caramelly note out of this one but not toasty in the same way that you're going to get from like an imperial stout or something like this um but yeah a few things going on there yeah for sure so what you'll find is you've almost got this kind of circle in the middle of your palate and in the dead centre of that you can feel the really concentrated brown sugary notes with the 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 booze of the beer. So in the dead centre it's really, really concentrated brown sugars and as you move out from that it starts to get a little bit sweeter and then as you reach the edge of that circle that I'm talking about that's when you get the more kind of toasty brown sugar and as you move out beyond that toward the edge the very edges, the extremities of that middle third of your palate, that's when you start to get the McVitie's digestive biscuity type qualities out of this beer. So yeah, that goes together really interestingly in this one. Um, yeah, some interesting stuff going on in this beer for sure. But yeah, bread crust, brown bread, and all that kind of brown sugary biscuity stuff that I'm talking about. To be honest with you, I think that covers the middle third of your palate. So let's look at the back third then. 
So border region between uh, middle third and back third of your palate. Again, you get a little bit of a bready build up in there, a nice little bit of bread crust. Then the base of the um, the base of that back third of your palate, yeah, a little bit of a kind of bread crusty note for sure. Um, the bread crust note, of course, bitter flavours come out toward the back of your palate, so it's a wee bit more grainy and bitter. On top of that, you can feel the bready notes, the brown bread. So that feels a little bit thicker. It's almost a wee touch. Um, it's almost a wee touch sweeter as well, actually, in a sense. But yeah, a little bit more of a kind of sweet brown bready character there, but definitely the grainy notes coming out as well, and it's almost thicker. So bread crust, thicker brown bread, and then on top of that, you get the yeasty notes out of the beer. So it's quite a grainy brown bread. There's a little bit of that almost kind of peppery quality coming out of it. So um, yeah, that works. Yeah. Um... On the, as I would say, on the, um, on top of that, I don't think there's anything else in, the, in terms of the, the back third of your palate. So yeah, bread crust, brown bread, then you've got that kind of yeasty part sitting on the top of the very back of your tongue. But definitely on the back third of your palate, you can feel the flavour is a little bit taller, but then as you come further forward, as you come further forward, the um the flavour just kind of condenses down a little bit, so it squashes together, and then those flavours are just a little bit more just dense. So, yeah, it works. I can feel the, the booze going to my head on this beer a little bit. I've only had a few sips of it right enough, but it is definitely going to my head at 11% ABV. So, um yeah, an interesting beer, this one, from that perspective, for sure. But I think that's everything we need to say about the yeasty and malty side of it. Let's focus on the hoppy part of the beer. Back corners of the palate, there's definitely a nice little bit of earthiness in there. As you come further forward, you do get quite a bit of, there is a wee bit of that piney resin character in there, but you've also got a little bit of a big, of a kind of spicy floral note in this. So that's most likely to be like Columbus and Chinook. There is just something telling me that it's a, pardon me, an old school hop. It's an old school um, pop profile. Um, that's used in this one there. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's Chinook and Columbus in this. Around the front curve of the palette, it's a little bit lighter and grassy, but you still you get a wee touch of zestiness out of it there. So yeah, I do think a little bit of Chinook and potentially Columbus in there. So the spiciness is telling me Columbus and the sort of dankness that the beer has tells me Chinook. So yeah, I think that. But let's focus on the front third of your palate then and the fruity part of the beer. So border region between front third and middle third of your palate, again, you get a little bit of a bready build up there. Nice wee touch of bread crust, but the base of that front third of your palate is like a smooth kind of brown bready character. So that works as well. And on top of that, you get that nice oily bubble where those juicy fruity esters just roll their way out of the beer. Um, and yeah, it's quite... The fruitiness in this one is quite interesting. So at the back of that front third of your palate, you do get a bit of that pungent grapefruit. And again, that would be a sign of Chinook. But on top of that, the layer that you get, as I say, there's a wee bit of that brown, the base layer of this front third of your palate is a bit of a smooth and slightly sweet brown bready note. You do get a little bit of an almost slightly figgy character, which to me indicates Cascade. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bit of Cascade in this. But yeah. On top of all of that, you get a bit of the, the stronger passion fruit as you move further forward. It become it may even be grapefruit. I think it is a stronger grapefruit you get there then. It mellows out to be a more kind of juicy passion fruit. Little teeny bit of mango, to be honest, but the mango takes a back seat to the passion fruit for me. And then as you move into the front half of the front third of your palate, it becomes distinctly more orangey and oily. So maybe amarillo. I think just going by the flavour you get, it seems a bit more oily, so I'd be tempted more to say Amarillo in this one. And as you reach the kind of front edge of the palette, it's got quite a bright kind of limey character to it. And that makes me think it could be Citra that's in there giving you some of the passion fruit and the, the grapefruit. But at the same time, you could have a little bit of Equinot in there because Equinot gives you quite a bright lime. And the lime in this for me at the, at the front tip of the tongue is... A bit brighter than I've experienced with Citra before but as I say you don't get too many West Coast IPAs these days so 
could be playing my my mind could be playing tricks on myself, but I wouldn't be surprised if this has something like you know Chinook, Columbus, uh, a bit of you know Citrus definitely possible, um or a bit of Simcoe and then Amarillo and potentially a wee bit of uh, Equinot in this one. I think the and the Cascade obviously as well. This is a very old school beer. This one in terms of its hot profile, it's it's quite obvious when you try this with a bit of experience that this one is, is quite an old school hot profile. I'd be very curious to know and I'm a bit disappointed that they didn't put that on the website. But yeah, this is a very old school hot profile that's in this one. I'm pretty sure of that. Mosaic is a possibility of course in this but I'm leaning towards saying it's I'm half leaning towards saying it's Amarillo because the orangey notes for me are quite oily but at the same time they're a bit brighter than I remember from Amarillo. It's been a long time since I've had uh, a, way, a big boozy West Coast IP. I don't know how many West Coast triples I ever I actually have ever had, to be honest with you. So that's another thing I need to say about this review. Is just take it with a pinch of salt in that sense. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice beer. This one actually, it's it's well done. It's very authentic to the style, and you can't ask for much more than that these days. But let's round off this one with a look at the mouthfeel then, um, and see how we go. So, um, definitely a full-bodied beer. Uh, carbonation is very, very smooth. It's a big oily. It's a big, yeah, big, big oily and slick beer, this one, for sure. Um, but would you really expect anything less of a, a West Coast triple IPA? You would expect it to be big and oily and slick like this. But on the... Um, I think the more that you drink of this, the kind of more bitter it actually gets. I, that's, that's a really interesting point about this, but the more that I sit and drink and ponder about this beer, the more the alcohol goes to my head. So, yeah, quality of the review definitely goes down in that sense. So, on the, yeah, full-bodied beer, smooth carbonation, quite slick and oily. In terms of IBUs, I think this one's got to be about maybe 60 IBUs. I don't, it's nowhere near as bitter as these beers used to be. But at the same time, you also have to remember your palate's constantly evolving. But I think this is maybe about 50 or 60 IBUs. It doesn't feel like the big 80, 90 IBU that we used to get um, in these beers. But remember, IBU is my weakest point of beer reviewing. So always take my IBU catch with a pinch of salt. But malt base wise, it's got a lovely kind of bready smoothness and slight sweetness to it. Big oily brown sugary character as well, which is what you want from this style. And a good oily fruity note as well so a good balance between the tropical side of things and also the the more citrusy side too so orange and lime coming out of this one and then the more kind of grapefruity pungent notes uh, as well but a really interesting beer and quite a quite an unusual choice i guess we could say for an 11th uh, for an 11th anniversary beer an anniversary beer of any description but kudos to them for doing something a wee bit different is it as good as dangerously close to stupid not 100% sure about that. I think Dangerously Close to Stupid might be a bit better than this beer, but that's just personal opinion, of course. Everyone has different opinions. Beer is relative, as they always say, but still, solid effort and quite an interesting one to put out there for your 11th anniversary. So, uh, yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one. So, uh, yeah, once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Total, and we will return to these guys at some point soon. They have released two other beers that I'm quite interested in, so I just need to see if I can actually get a hold of those. But thank you for watching. Check out my social media. Check out Total's social media. Let me know your own thoughts in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are and all this. And we'll see you very soon. This one was the 11th anniversary triple IPA, a West Coast triple IPA, 11% ABV from Total in Svinninge on Sealand over in Denmark. Slange, skull and cheers.